So good morning, welcome to uh, Numerical Methods. And we are maybe still a bit in our session on, on the Monte Carlo method, but we started a new chapter, namely the one of random number generation. So random number generation can be viewed as an independent topic. Yeah, Let's generate a sequence that yeah, closely mimics uh, random drawings of a random variable. But clearly our application is uh, the Monte Carlo approximation. So our application is that we know that this running sum, say some f of xi, well, approximates the expectation. And then we took the special version where xi are uniform on zero one. So it approximates the integral f of x dx. And we could see that we easily could move to higher dimensions. Well, what we do in the application is that we use that as an approximation. So this is approximately the integral. And we plug in a single event omega such that on the left hand side, this is F evaluated on my random number sequence. And unfortunately, we saw that the convergence result only holds in expectation. Yeah? So it wasn't even clear if that would be here admissible. So we had this nice convergence result and issue was that it only holds here in uh, probability. So it's not clear if it holds on my single event omega. But on the other hand, we had this nice session last time that, yeah, this is a, is a feature. So the random nature is a feature because it breaks this dependency on the dimension because we add a new information in every dimension. Okay. So the surprising result that we will see today removes this in probability and we will get a pointwise convergence result or a pointwise error estimate. And for that, maybe let's look at our little experiment again, where we plotted um, a two dimensional random vector by using our little trick that we can generate a two dimensional random vector from a one dimensional random sequence, by just populating the elements one after the other. So actually that is the thing that breaks this dependency on the dimension because it doesn't make a big difference for the convergence result if it is a vector you know, having several components and then it's a new element or if it's just a sequence of elements. Yeah? It doesn't make a difference to him. So if we run this little example, so you see here's a loop uh, looping over 1000 sample points. We take two random numbers and form that uh, vector. Yeah? I store that vector here in, in, in a list X and Y separately, and then I can plot it. But if I run that, we get this uh, picture here. So maybe I run that now with fewer points. So maybe just take 100 points. Yeah? So we get a picture like that. You see the points are 
randomly distributed, for example, like that. And if you look at this picture, you see that there are areas where there's almost nothing. So we do not evaluate the function there. And there are some clusters where we have many points. So is this a good, good feature? So if you look at our Monte Carlo integral, then you see that actually that the sequence xi is random so that they occur in a random order doesn't matter because I could just sort the xi, yeah? so from the smallest to the largest, and I would still have the same sum. Yeah? So given that you have a fixed sequence, yeah? so I have a fixed sequence here, I could just sort the sequence and the Monte Carlo integral would still remain the same. So we see that actually we are not so much interested in the randomness. So what is then the property uh, that we need? So the important property that we need is that the sequence fills the space quite evenly. So when we go back to our little experiment here with the random points, actually, I would like to avoid such things that we have areas where there's maybe nothing and there are clusters where we have maybe many points. Maybe that's not a good property, uh, but this comes from the fact that the sequence is a sequence of random drawing. Let's explore this a little bit by going back to our Monte Carlo integration experiment. So remember, We already implemented two different integrations. So we had here our Simpsons integrator that uses some indices and then performs some equidistant partitioning with a very special scheme of coefficients to four and so on, plus the two endpoints. Then we had our Monte Carlo integrator that was much simpler. So we just generate a stream of random numbers and perform the evaluation. Yeah, what happens if we just take a stream of random numbers, but instead of being really random, we just take an evenly spaced partitioning. So that's actually what a Riemann sum would do. Let's create that integrator. So I call this guy now a quasi Monte Carlo integrator. The name will become clearer later. It is not a quasi Monte Carlo integrator, but uh, yeah, to some extent, it is maybe one. Um, I would like to implement my interface integrator. So I have to implement this method here. And as um, a field, I need the number of sample points. So it's very similar to here what the Simpsons does. I need something like here, the number of evaluation points that I would like to use. So let's generate a constructor that allows me to pass here the number of evaluation points. So now having these evaluation points, 
the number of evaluation points, I would like to proceed a little bit similar to the Monte Carlo integrator. So I would like to generate here a stream of floating point double numbers, but I would like to generate them just evenly spaced. So what I do is I create a double stream. Let's call it also random numbers. But now I take a stream of integers, so indices from zero to number of evaluation points not included. And then I apply the following map. So this should map, this is a stream of integers. This should map to a floating point double number. And the map that I would like to apply maps the index to say just the index times and then one divided by N. So 1.0 divided by number of evaluation points. Okay, so this is now not a stream of random numbers. Yeah? It's just the numbers zero, one divided by N, two divided by N and so on. So it's very structured but it's filling the space very evenly. And now I go back to my Monte Carlo integrator and just do the same that we did here. So I calculate the sum and I return the sum divided by the number of evaluation points. Well, if the integral domain is not from zero to one, then I have to adjust for that. So I define here the range, which is the upper bound minus the lower bound. So compare this guy to our Monte Carlo integrator. You see, it's just the same that, except that we generate here the sequence of, well, say random numbers, not random, we generate it in this form. We had for our integrators, small test classes. Yeah? So we had here for the Simpson integrator, we integrate the cosine, it was here from zero to 1.5 using 101 points. And we had <clears throat> the same for the Monte Carlo integrator, integrating the cosine here, checking with 1000 points. Maybe let's do the same test now for our new integrator. So I just copy here this guy and I call it now quasi. Monte Carlo integrator test. Okay. And of course here, I would like to use the other integrator. Okay, so um, I'm using 1000 points here. Maybe let's run now the three tests on the cosine. So if we run the Simpsons method, we get with 100 points, a very good result. Okay, it's because the method has this very special structure. So let's run now the Monte Carlo integrator, the one using here, the Monte Carlo integrator, so using the true random number sequence. Okay, if I run that guy. Okay, so we get here, well, an error of 0.004. So maybe I use here 10,000. This is a 10 to the power of four. Yeah, and you get approximately a 10 to the power of minus two. Yeah, so one divided by square root of n uh, approximation error. Yeah, so that fits somewhat to our expectation. Maybe we use maybe a six here, a 10 to the uh, six as the number of sample points. And I get, well, I would expect a 10 to the minus three, yeah, it's square root. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm a little bit better, 10 to the minus four. Maybe I use an eight. So, and with 10 to the power of eight sample points, 
it takes quite a while. We get a 10 to the minus power of four. So you see the convergence results here. Yeah. So let's go back to the say, Ten to the power of four separate points, yeah, ten thousand separate points. Okay, so that is our Monte Carlo. So now let's have a look at here our quasi Monte Carlo integrator, also using it with ten thousand. So I have here the same test now. You see, the only change is here the quasi. Monte Carlo integrator. So I use now the integrator that uses here this very regular placing of the numbers. So let's run this test. So here he, he always prints the class that we are testing. So let's run that test. Okay, and that's a 10 to the minus five. Yeah, we would expect one, two, three, four, a 10 to the minus two. Oh, one divided by square root, um, but we get a 10 to the minus four. So it looks much better. So let's take a six. That's approximately a 10 to the minus six. Let's take an eight. That's approximately a 10 to the minus eight. So it looks as if this guy has convergence order one divided by n and not one divided by square root of n. So this guy converges much better than our Monte Carlo integrator. So from this little experiment, you already see that it is an advantage to have an evenly spaced yeah, filling of the space. Yeah? So here, this was the random sequence. This is the evenly spaced sequence. And you can even improve this here if you just um, add one half to the index. So instead of taking always the left point, you take uh, the center point. That would even improve this convergence. So before it was a 10 to the minus nine. Now it's a 10 to the minus 16. So this is this is really uh, a huge improvement. <coughs> so if we go back to our initial small experiment, yeah, say I use one thousand here, and I use one thousand here. So if I run the Monte Carlo random number sequence, it was this. 0 0.004, and now I run the quasi also with 1000 sample points, evenly spaced using the center points, and I get a 10 to the minus eight. This here in the script is the code session I just did with you. So just write another integrator using this equidistant partitioning here. And of course, this here is the place where you can find the code if you would like to explore this later. So if you go back here to this picture, you see that randomness was an advantage, but filling the space evenly is also something what we would like to have. So I would like to have a sequence that has still the good properties of a random number sequence, but fills the space in an even manner, no? so evenly. And how can we characterize this? So the measure that characterizes this is called the discrepancy. So here's the definition of the discrepancy, the measure that characterizes if my sequence is filling the space evenly. So let's read this. So I'm considering here my unit hypercube, so zero one. So I'm in D dimension to the power of D. And I have a sequence in this unit cube. And now I define the discrepancy which is a function of this sequence. So all the numbers as, okay, so what's that? So let's work from the inside 
to the outside. I consider in my unit hypercube endpoints A and B. So these are now vectors. So this actually then defines a rectangle in 0, 1, D. For example, that rectangle, so that guy here is the point A. Well, this is A1, A2, yeah, the two coordinates. And that guy here is the point B with the two coordinates, B1 and B2. So I define this rectangle by looking at these two points. Then I count the number of points that are inside this rectangle. So take the set xi for which xi is in the rectangle AB. So I just count the number of points that are here in this rectangle. One, two, three, four, five, six. I have six points. And I divide that by the number of n of sample points. So this part is just the percentage of points that are in the rectangle. So and now I would like to have a man, uh, measure that characterizes, are we evenly spaced? Yeah, so how many points would I expect in a rectangle from A vector to B vector? So, well, this is the cube zero one. So the whole cube has volume one, 100%. So it's just the volume. So I would expect lambda AB, where lambda is just the volume of my rectangle, percent points in this uh, rectangle. So I just compare here this with the volume. And take the difference. So how much do I deviate from this perfect, yeah, perfect dis distribution? So of course you have then some areas where you have much more points than you would expect from the volume. I have a small volume, but many points. Or you have areas where you have very few points compared to what you would expect from the volume. Yeah? So for example, here I have zero, but I would expect at least say 10 points or something like that. So because sometimes you are too high, sometimes you are too low, uh, you take here the absolute value of this difference. And then I take the supremum over all possible endpoints for this rectangle. Now that sounds like a very reasonable measure to measure how much do we deviate from say a perfect uh, evenly filling of this space. There's a, another simplified uh, definition, the so-called star discrepancy. And this is just given by considering the A to be zero. So it's always the left endpoint. So we are looking here at B being the upper right endpoint, so the rectangle from zero to B. So you just do this by taking rectangles like that or like that yeah, for different B. Yeah? So now you go through all possible values of B 
and count the number of points divided by the total number of points compared it to the volume. You can easily prove the following relation. Of course, the discrepancy is always larger than the star discrepancy because in the discrepancy, I'm exploring more rectangles. But there's also an upper bound yeah, because you can construct or bound the value that you have for a rectangle inside by just taking the larger one and the smaller one and then compare it a little bit. And you have to do this in every dimension. yeah. So for every coordinate and uh, you can prove that upper bound. So since we have this uh, relation here, it's maybe enough to work with the star discrepancy, which is a bit uh, simpler. And also in the theorem that will pop up later, which will be a surprise, yeah? um, the star discrepancy enters. So in what follows, I work now with the star discrepancy. There is an elementary method for now calculating this star discrepancy. Because in the definition, I have the supremum over all possible rectangles. Yeah? If I use the star discrepancy, it's the supremum over all possible points B. Yeah? I have to calculate the difference of the number of points in that rectangle and the volume. But of course, if you move B a little bit, and you do not cross a new point, it's just a linear function. Okay, because the counting of the number of points that are inside this interval uh, doesn't change. Maybe I go to the definition. Okay, so here. So why is that? So because if I modify here the B, yeah, let's use A equals zero, then the counting only changes if I cross a new point. So that here remains a constant for some time until you cross a new point. So until a new point falls into the interval or until some point has fallen out of the interval. But this function here changes multi-linearly. So if you just move one coordinate, it changes linearly. So you see that the discrepancy will then be a multilinear function in each coordinate, and it just jumps at the points where you cross a point, a sample point, so where a new point falls or into the rectangle or falls out of the rectangle. And since I'm looking for the supremum, this is attained at the jump points. Yeah? So either the highest point or the lowest point. So it's just enough to look at the rectangles, which are shortly before or shortly after I cross a point. So this looks a little bit clumsy, a little bit complicated here. But uh, what we do now is the following. Um, I have a sequence x1 to xn in my hypercube. And I now define the set of coordinate sequences. So the gamma J is the set of the coordinate, the J's coordinate of my element XI yeah, for I's running from one to N. So just the projection to the coordinate. And then I also include the one, and then I form the set of points. So this here is also a set of points. That is formed by all combinations of these coordinates. So this set gamma X looks a little bit complicated, but it's really trivial. Okay, if you like to have a small drawing in two dimensions, so what's that set? Well, there's my one here, my one here. And now assume that my sequence has say, for example, these three sample points. Okay, 
then you build this set gamma j. So this is my gamma one. I just take here the I just take here the corresponding coordinates. And that here is my gamma two. Maybe make this a bit nicer. So these guys here were now my original points. But now I construct the gamma of x by taking all the intersection points. So we take also this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, and that guy. And note that we also include the boundaries. So I have the one here and the one here. So we also take the intersection points with the boundaries. Okay, so this is now my set gamma of x, and that guy is also there. And you just need now to check this measure. So this for a single point, this difference of the volume and how many points fall into the rectangle, you just need to check it for these points x. Once the point is not included, so there is here an open sign set, and once the point is included, yeah, so there is here a closed set. So how much does this expression change from before and after you cross this um, point? So you only need to check um, a finite set of points. Well, actually, if you move to higher dimensions, you see that you have to check many points. So maybe this is more a theoretical result, but it gives you maybe also some intuition. What is this discrepancy doing? For the intuition, it's also maybe nice to look at what is happening in the one dimensional case. Yeah. So this here is now the two dimensional case. But if you look at the one dimensional case and you think of this where you have the five sample points, then how does the star discrepancy look like? So the star discrepancy is just looking at an interval from zero to X. So assume that here you have the X, then I count no point in this interval. So it's the interval from zero to X. I count no point in this interval. So these two guys here are zero. So it's zero divided by N. Um, regardless if I include the X or if the X is not included. And the other part is the volume. So since you take the maximum, it's actually the first part. So it's this part here. The volume is increasing linearly. Yeah, as a function of X. But this holds until we reach the queen point, until we reach the queen sample point. Then this guy jumps to a one divided by N once we have crossed the sample points. So this guy is one divided by N if we are at an X plus epsilon because the X is not there. And this guy here is the one divided by N once we are at the X. So we will jump with a minus one divided by N. This minus one divided by n comes now from counting the point. We jump with a 
minus one divided by n if we are after the point. So that means the point here still belongs to the point x. So for x, it's still a zero here. So I just look now at the first part of this maximum here. Um, so if you like, we are now plotting this part here. Okay, so I move up and this point belongs. And then we jump down and this point here is not included. And then I increase x and we have again the linear function. So I increase x again and I have again the linear function until we reach the next point, it's the three. And then this one will jump from a one divided by n to a two divided by n because now two points are in the set. So we will jump down again and the jump that we have is another minus one divided by n. This guy belongs to the set. This one does not belong to the set. So now let's go on. And you have this nice picture where now I'm just plotting here the part that is here on the left. So what's the other part? Actually, the other part is flipping the sign and uh, the point is now included in the set. So it's flipping the sign. So actually it's flipping the curve yeah? and uh, it's that these points then belong to the guy. So it depends a little bit if your discrepancy is on the plus side, where it means that you have too few points in a rectangle because the volume has grown uh, faster than the counting of the points which is the case here. So I have too few points here in this area. Um, or if you are on the minus side where um, the volume has grown too slow. So you have too many points in a certain area. So I take then the maximum over the two parts. Okay, because I have flipped here the sign, I can take the maximum. So it's actually which point here has the largest absolute value. So that's the question. And you see from that picture that here, the star discrepancy would be this value. So this would be my D star. This is the value X where we have the largest difference between counting the points and calculating the volume. And in that case, it is attained here at the first part, which means the volume is too large compared to what we've counted, which means we have too few points. And you clearly see that you have here a wide range where I do not have sample points because my sampling distributed the points a little bit to the sides. Okay, so that's a nice measure the discrepancy. If we go back to um, our little computer experiment here, where we had this quasi Monte Carlo integrator. Okay, so I created here the evenly spaced stream. So if you go without this one half, it is zero, one divided by n, two divided by n, and so on. If you make this one half, it's just a shift. So what's the discrepancy of the sequence? Well, you see that the volume is just how large is a gap. And you jump at points that are distributed with one divided by n. So if you have a linear function, the linear function will uh, go, go up linearly, and then it will jump with one divided by n. So if you consider our example here where we used that sequence, 
which was very, very good. Yeah, very optimal. Okay, so how would that function look like? So if that is here the zero, yeah, we, our first sample point was say here, which was 0.5 divided by N. And then our next sample point was maybe here, which was 1.5 divided by N. So this guy here is one divided by N. And this guy here is two divided by n. So then you see that my discrepancy function is increasing up to the point 0.5 divided by n. And then it's jumping down by a one divided by n. And then it's increasing again with the slope one to the next point, which is at 1.5 divided by n. And it's jumping down by a one divided by n. And you see that this is really um, a perfect zigzag fu function where each such guy here is one divided by two n. So this sequence has discrepancy. So you can either take the top guys here or the bottom guys to measure it, has discrepancy d star. So that star discrepancy of this sequence is one half, one divided by n. And we already had the feeling that if we use this integration method here as our quasi Monte Carlo integration, then we get a convergence order, which is much better and which looked really a little bit like one divided by N. So indeed, there will be the result that if you take a sequence of random numbers or whatever numbers, then if you take the Monte Carlo integral, so you do as if it would be the sequence of random numbers, then the error estimate is bounded by the discrepancy of the sequence. So the one divided by square root of n will be replaced by the discrepancy of the sequence. And that's an amazing thing. Okay, so we are a little bit on a journey where in the end we can replace this in probability by characterizing the sequence. And this guy here, our one divided by square root of n will be replaced by something that characterizes the discrepancy. Actually, it will be replaced by the discrepancy. But there was a second ingredient here in this estimate. And this ingredient is apart from something that is related to the sequence, there's also something that is related to the function f. So how does the function f behave? Remember that if I take just one point, actually the integral is perfectly approximated by one point if the function is constant. So I need a second ingredient that characterizes um, the variability of the function. So, but now this sigma is here the variance. It's something related to that xi is random. If I would like to move away from random, I have to do something else. Also recall that for the Simpsons rule, we had something that related to the false derivative. So somehow I need a measure that characterize how does the function f vary. So that's my next ingredients, the variation in the sense of Hardy and Krause. So I would like to have a measure that measures how volatile, how much variance is there in the function. So the other factor in the convergence rate result was characterizing the variability of F and he is now a measure that characterizes this. It's the variation 
So maybe you remember the variation from the one dimensional case. Okay, uh, if you have If you have, for example, this function here in one dimension, okay, what do you do? You just count where you have an upward slope here and where you have a downward slope here. And you just need to count this uh, separately. So what you do is you calculate the integral f prime of x dx. So if you calculate that and f prime has a sign, it's just the f of x. Yeah. So, um, but since I do not want that upward and downward is canceling, I add an absolute value here. So maybe you remember that this is the variation of a function. Yeah? So you just add uh, the upward to the downward without the sign. And now I need something that corresponds to this, but I have a function in D dimensions. So now my F is a function on the unit cube, the D dimensional hypercube zero one to the power of D. So in order to define this, I have to look at the variation in every dimension, in every coordinate, okay? But there could be a dependency that if you move into one coordinate and look at how does the variation change in that coordinate. So for example, here is now viewed from the top, yeah? this is x1 and x2. And you now would like to define something like that here uh, along the line x1. So for say a fixed x2, you would now fix x2 and just integrate, differentiate with respect to x1, take the absolute value and integrate here along this line. Then of course, it can be that if you move the x2, that there is a certain dependency. For example, it could be that the function only depends on a diagonal, okay, that lies there. So you also have to check how does the first derivative change if the other value changes, which is the cross derivative, which is the second derivative. So in higher dimensions, we need also the other derivatives of the functions. So this looks a little bit complicated here, but what we do is the following. We define a function V superscript K, and this V superscript K is actually the variation when we just fix ourselves on k coordinates, namely the k coordinates that are specified here with the indices i1 to ik. So assume you are in five dimensions and you would just look at a function that depends on three coordinates, so v superscript three, well, it could then depend on dimension one, two, three, or one, two, four, or one, four, five, or whatever. So you look at all those functions where you restrict the function f on the coordinates i1 to ik. And for the other components you use a zero. So that means instead of looking here at my plot, I just look at 
what happens in the x1 direction. And I fix x2 to be zero. And I calculate the variation in this direction. I calculate now the variation by differentiating the f and taking here the absolute value and then integrate. Then I do the same also in the direction of x2. Okay, but these are just the one dimensional boundary cases. So I also have to consider the other cases. So I also consider the f as a function of two variables, but then if I do that, I have to also look at the second derivative of f with respect to x1 and x2. So I'm considering here the case derivative of this function that depends on case component with respect to coordinates xi1 to xi2 uh, k. Yeah. So this is that we also consider the variation in the mixed coordinates. Then I find uh, that I define these partial variations and I just take the sum over all those variations having all possible combinations of coordinates all the one dimensional variations or the two dimensional variations and so on up to the whole function D. Okay, so that's just maybe the D dimensional analog here to this uh, one dimensional uh, variation. So it's the absolute value of the derivative integrated. So now that we have a measure that characterizes how much does the function vary. And for example, see if the function is a constant, this variation is zero, yeah? Because I start here with k equals one. So I'm doing at least the first derivative. So if the function is a constant, that derivative will be zero. All the guys will be zero. So for a constant function, the variation is zero, of course. Now I can put the two parts together and we get the very nice coxma lafka inequality that now replaces our um, convergence result. So if F has bounded total variation as defined in the previous sense on the unit hypercube, then we have for any sequence x1 to xn in the unit cube that the difference of my Monte Carlo approximation, so my Monte Carlo simulation, my Monte Carlo integral, so the sum f of xi that using that sequence multiplied with one divided by n deviates from the true solution this can be bounded by, and wow, well, that's now nice, the variation of the function multiplied with the discrepancy of the sequence. And note, this is a pointwise result. Okay, so that's nice. This replaces now our Monte Carlo convergence result. So here's my Monte Carlo convergence result. Oh, and actually I did the coloring the other way around. So maybe let's do that also here. I have a property that is related to 
the function, it's the variation of a function. And I have a property that is related to the sequence. It's the discrepancy of the sequence and the product of the two are bounding my Monte Carlo integral approximation error. As, as before here for the random sequence, but now I got rid of this. It holds only in probability. So I now have, have, have a true uh, convergence rate for that specific sequence. And you see the property of the sequence. This is the one divided by square root of n. And this is now here, the discrepancy. And you already saw that we have, say, a discretization of the interval from zero to one that has a very small discrepancy, just i divided by n, or even better, i plus one half divided by n. And also maybe nice for the um, intuition, this one divided by square root of n was really something that was related here to this sequence xi. And that remark was already here in the script, but I skipped it. Um, so this term, one divided by square root of n in the Monte Carlo conversions rate, this really corresponds to a property of the sequence. Because if you just consider the function f to be the identity, then if you look here at the average of xi, xi being uniform distributed, then you see that this one divided by square root of n is the sigma, is the standard deviation of this sequence, okay? So we had the variance of the function f and the, actually we had the sigma, so we had the standard deviation of the function f of xi, and we had the standard deviation of the sequence separated in our estimate. So that here was the standard deviation of the function characterizing the function f, and that here was the standard deviation characterizing the, the sequence. And now we have exactly these two parts, but we can find sequences that have here a better property. Even more striking, this bound in this uh, theorem is sharp. So it means that like we did in our little session where we ha had elaborated an intuition for why the Monte Carlo method is independent of the dimension. There we just found a function yeah, that was always maybe bad for a given sequence. You can do something like that here. So for any given sequence x1 to xn and a prescribed epsilon, you can find a function f yeah, that has variation one. So in the estimate, the V of F is just a one, such that the error, the approximation error is larger than D star minus epsilon. Yeah? So the bound is sharp. Yeah, maybe we can, we can prove that at least for one dimension. Because here with this picture, it's maybe easy to see. 
So first of all, assume that my sequence is ordered. So I have an ordered sequence and assume that it attains the discrepancy in a point xk. So we already know that in our example, this here was the star discrepancy. So this here is xk. So it attains this. And in my definition of the discrepancy, there were two terms. There was the lambda minus the ratio of the points in the interval. And there was the ratio of the point in the interval minus the lambda with the point included, the other one with the point excluded. So assume that it attains this maximum in the left expression of six. So actually that's exactly this guy. Um, the other guy works the other way around because now I will construct a function that comes from the left. If it is the other guy, you construct a function that comes from the right. Yeah, it's just the same, the same idea. Okay, so what's the discrepancy? So I know that the discrepancy is attained in this point. Yeah. So the discrepancy is lambda of zero and xk. Okay, that is just xk minus, okay, how many points are in this interval? So it is zero to xk not included, intersected with my sequence. So I know that this is a k, yeah? There are k points before because my sequence is ordered. So this here is a k divided by n. Uh, sorry, k minus one divided by n. Yeah, there are k minus one points before. So we know that the star discrepancy is exactly xk minus k minus one divided by n. So now I define a smooth function that is equal to one shortly before that point. So maybe I take here a small epsilon. So this point here is xk minus epsilon. So I have a function that is one up to this point. So the one is on top, maybe move here. And then the function should be zero after xk. So the function is zero here. Okay, and then it should be a smooth function. Yeah, so maybe you just go down here. Okay, like that. So if you take that function, the variation of this function is clearly one. Yeah, it just makes a single jump from one to zero. So I have that the variation of the function is one. And now look at the error. So integrating this function f, this is here the area below that. Okay, so if I integrate the function f, well, I can just take here the xk minus epsilon and take the rectangle. And I know that the integral is larger than xk minus epsilon, right? So this integral, this is the integral of the function. And the Monte Carlo approximation. Yeah, the Monte Carlo approximation of this function is just evaluating the function. The function is one here, one here, but it is already zero here, zero here. So the Monte Carlo integral of the function is a k minus one divided by n. So you have 
the xk minus the k minus one divided by n, that was exactly the discrepancy minus the epsilon because we forgot this part here. So you see that the error that we have is larger than d star minus epsilon. Okay, so now for your script, maybe a little bit nicer drawn, the proof that this bound is sharp. So you see that uh, it's really the thing that you can construct a function that has its variability in the region where you do not have sample points. So if we go back to this picture, yeah, you see that this guy here is a problem because you could construct a function that has a lot of stuff going on there and your Monte Carlo integral wouldn't recognize it. Okay, so now the summary is that we would like to have a sequence that has low discrepancy. So we started this journey by well, making, making a strange, almost useless approximation of the probability. And we found our Monte Carlo integral um, to have this striking property that the convergence is independent of the dimension. But now it looks a little bit as if we go back yeah, and just want to find a sequence that is no longer random. And how do the two things fit together? Well, my sequence one divided by n has a disadvantage. The sequence has low discrepancy. Actually, it is the sequence with the lowest discrepancy. But whenever you change the number of points n, you have to generate a new sequence. So we lost a remarkable property of the Monte Carlo method, namely that the next point is independent, an independent sampling of the previous point so that we can add more points to the previous approximation to improve the accuracy. So what I would like to have instead is an infinite sequence that runs on and on where every partial sequence, so from one to N, from one to M, from one to two M or whatever, has low discrepancy without recreating the first elements. So it is an infinite sequence such that every partial sequence has low discrepancy. And that's something completely different. And that's not what we have here. And such a sequence is called a low discrepancy sequence. So that's now the next section. We will discuss how we can construct sequences that have low discrepancy. And then we suddenly combine the nice properties of the Monte Carlo method. We have an infinite sequence with a convergence rate 
And the nice properties here of the low discrepancy sequence and the Coxma Lovequa inequality that we have a point wise convergence uh, rate. So to conclude, maybe you can make the small experiment with yourself, yeah, how you would create an infinite sequence between zero and one in one dimension that has almost always low discrepancy. So of course, if you choose the first point, you would choose maybe the center point. Yeah, but what's, what, what do you do next? Yeah, I mean, you can choose that guy, which is improving the discrepancy on the left side, but still on the right side, you do not have low discrepancy. So the third point should really go here. But now, how do you proceed? Yeah, Maybe you choose as a next point that guy. Should you then choose that guy? Okay, maybe that guy is not a good one. Maybe you should go to the other side and improve this one. Yeah? And then maybe that one and that one. So how would you now construct a sequence that fills the space evenly in a certain sense at all possible times? That was it for today, thanks. <laughs>